What is revolutionary about love? One thing is the way the community uh, at Middle Church has been a laboratory for me to think about this. I uh, grew up uh, in Chicago, mostly Air Force Brat, but before, after that Chicago, I grew up in a context where my mom and dad uh, being diverse, like in the Air Force, you're like two black families and everybody else is white. But my mom and dad had um, been born in Mississippi, raised in Mississippi, raised in Jim Crow, you know, all the things, walk past the, walk past the school to go to the colored school. Both of them left in the great black migration that, that you've read about with Isabel Wilkerson, no doubt, to go north, to find a, a way to be liberated and live a free life, a, a bold and free life. And when they got to the Air Force, they, when they got to, to, to uh, Omaha, Nebraska, they both head there in different ways. My dad in the service, my mom to work as a waitress at the officer's club at the same base where her brother lived. And it turned out that her brother and my dad became best friends. Mom and dad went on a date, they, they conceived me and they got married and they did everything they could to make sure that the Lewis kids did not internalize racism. They wanted us to really feel that no matter what we did, how we did it, if we worked hard, we loved hard, we could be what we wanted to be. So they put this bubble around us in lots of ways, but not bubble enough that when I was in kindergarten in New Hampshire, that little Lisa who moved from Mississippi, ironically enough, called me the N word for the first time when I was five years old. And before that I wasn't raced. I just was Jackie. My parents were black, Christian, all the things that they were, but she introduced this this story into my life. And I think the way my parents handled it, hi Ayana, I think the way my parents handled it was the beginning of this sense of love being revolutionary. Mom framed this story of race as silly. She didn't have like the sophisticated analysis that race is a construct, it's a social construct, it's meant to do economic harm, you know, this, she didn't do that. But she said, believe it or not, Jackie, this is so silly that people won't love you just because of your color. It's like the perfect five-year-old intervention. Not we're going to hate them back, not we're going to, you know, you know, we're not going to, that's not how we do it. In fact, in that story, when the girl called me the N-word, I called her a cracker. I don't know where I had ever heard that word before, but it was like it manifested itself like, whoop, okay, if I'm the N-word, you're a cracker. Here we go. Two little girls living out this story that we didn't write but that we inherited. And mom said, we don't, we're not doing that. We're not calling people crackers either. <laughs> so it's like both no to the, to the silliness of the construct and no to retaliatory violent response. But then, and then that night we sit our nightly late, you know, now I lay me down to sleep prayer, which is by the way, scary, but let's talk about that another time. Traumatizing children, like if I die before I wake. Um, I prayed, no matter what color people are, let them feel loved. And she reminded me of that over my life. Like she just, you know, she held that. That's how I remember it. I don't know exactly that I would remember it, but I remember it because she sort of brought that forth. No matter what color people are, no matter what, how much money to make, no matter where they live, no matter the gender sexuality, they, they, they should be loved. They deserve love. They are loved. So that's a, that's a really a foundational story for me. The next morning, my dad went to the Air Force commander and demanded that Mr. Mann, who's raised the racist little girl, <laughs> come and apologize to him and that she would apologize to me. So that story also put something inside me about what is revolutionary about love. Because I think even as a little kid, I had this misunderstanding that this Jesus character that we were learning about in church that he was like nice, you know, he was nice. And in fact, adults gave us nice Jesus to manage us anytime, you know, right? Like 
Jesus wouldn't have a temper or Jesus wouldn't, you know, talk back to his parents or, you know, like, it was like the most really special little person that didn't have any feelings and didn't have any, like, mad and didn't have any anger, didn't have any ambition, just like a blonde, nice guy. And what dad introduced about revolutionary love was actually love demands things. And I got that from dad before I got that from King or Gandhi, that love is ferocious about justice. It, it, you know, Paul's big love poem in, in Corinthians, and I know that all of you, are not, I know you're not, like this is not a faith conversation, so I'm not trying to give you a faith answer. I'm talking about the, the stories that, that were in my world or uh, black history, you know, and we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. John, uh, uh, John Weldon, uh, James Weldon Johnson's poem that became a song. And my parents, you know, uh, migration and slavery and Jim Crow breaking and the Southern Freedom Movement, which is called the Civil Rights Movement. Like these are the stories that were in my life. So my dad entered into the story of, we don't take that either. We don't love demands on justice, love, love insists on justice. This poem from Paul that's like, love does not insist on its own way. Love insists, actually it does. So I've got, I've got a repudiation on Paul. It actually does demand and insist on its own way. It insists on love, love insists on love. So I got that early package from my folks. And then Dr. King was killed. So I'm five when that happens. I think I wanna tell you that when I was nine that year I had a couple of different traumatic things happen that made me think about love as revolutionary one is um, in April right before my ninth birthday Dr. King is murdered assassinated I'm having a vague memory of Kennedy's assassination when I'm that age I was four three, four, when he got killed. I remember watching my mother watch the funeral, watch the, watch the casket, watch John John salute, watch the little girl in the dress. You know, I had a memory of that. Um, mom crying, me beginning to cry, her holding me, smelling like Jergens lotion and just like all lovely. And me thinking, so when, so that is a catastrophic, my mother is crying. And I'm holding her face while she cries. She's crying because Kennedy's killed. And then King is killed. And it's a different reaction all across the country and in my family. My mom and dad are so hurt, they're just outraged. And the, and the outrage is like even that, you know, even working against the war, working for economic justice, working for peace, working for love, even that in a black man gets you shot to death on a balcony. It was a, just, it was just, you know, the vibrations in my family were strong. My, the vibrations in the community were strong. My parents didn't get into like shooting and rioting and all that, but our neighborhood erupted and I was hiding under my bed with my sister where bullets were flying outside. And I was thinking then, I, I think this is my job. And I, I'm, I kid you not, I'm almost nine and I'm clear that my job is that I'm gonna be a drum, a drum major for peace. So I think, I think the, it was kind of like a response to the trauma that I felt like I had something I could do about it. <coughs> Pardon me. And my parents fueled that with, yes, you can. So uh, subscribe to Cesar Chavez's newsletter, make the donations to the Heifer Project, help kids buy cows, march, march for dimes, march against hunger. Like they, they just were like, yes, yes, yes. And so I read all the things and I marched and I, like I'm dying. And I had, an, I had a, an unsafe touch experience on my ninth birthday. So a month later, a, a man in my family that I, I trusted sort of grabbed me and kissed me and tried to touch my vagina and didn't get there uh, because I was interrupted. And so that is an interesting trauma that made me feel super powerless and, and squished down and impinged. And, but a few months later, when that same man 
kind of came on to me and said, I thought about you all night that night. I'm like, what? So I then at nine said, if you ever talk to me like that again or ever touch me again, I'm telling. And, and so it, it was the beginning of an activism that had the seed being planted with, with Lisa and the Air Force. And the, so revolutionary love concept is beginning to grow inside as I'm going to have to love myself in a revolutionary way. And then, can, and then Robert Kennedy's killed. So these three things. And when Robert Kennedy's killed, I become obsessed with Sirhan Sirhan. What the hell? And the lady in the polka dot dress and what, you know, all this justice stuff. And I think I'm going to go to law school, but I'm, but I'm clear that I'm going to be a theologian. But so I'm putting together this sense for you that we are the product of the stories told to us. We, we are the product of the stories told to us about us. We are storied selves, right? We, we can think about de development as Freudian's way or Erickson's way or family systems way. I really love the way, if we think about it as the stories, <coughs> we can keep unfolding, keep having midwives who help us birth new stories, understand our stories. And so I'm wanting to say revolutionary love is for me a way, a narrative way to frame human development, my development and yours and ours, and the development of a culture, the development of society. So it's starting with first, the self. There's no mystery that all the world's major religions just about teach us to love our neighbor as ourself. In the Greek, the word as is os, and it literally is an equal sign. So love your neighbor exactly as you love yourself. <clears throat> the neighbor that is your daughter, Derek, the neighbor that is your dad, the neighbor that is your, the neighbor that is your enemy, the neighbor that is the one that lives around the world in India, far away from you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I don't think that, I think that the reason that shows up in all the major religions, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Zoroastrian, I looked up, um, Baha'i, Sikhdom, all of them, is because I think it originates in Africa and we originate in Africa. Our first mother is Eve in Africa. I've been there to see her remnants, you know, her footprints in, uh, in Johannesburg in the museum. But if, we, if the human community sort of takes root in Africa, I think it takes root in the concept of Ubuntu. Do you all know Ubuntu? No. It is, it, it, it sort of started, be, it's been an African concept since forever, since, 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 the, since the desert was an ocean. <laughs> Conversations about Ubuntu were happening inside of villages. But I, it became a, an American consciousness concept as we watched South Africans um, become liberated from apartheid. So Mandela and Bishop Tutu, but so many people in the truth and reconciliation concept, uh, a movement. Ubuntu, the word Ubuntu is really humanity. And the expression is a human is a human through other humans. A human is a human through other humans. So I, am, I do not exist except that Beth is a person. Both Beths, I see two Beths. <laughs> I am a person, I am a human being through other human beings. In the Zulu uh, language, and there are lots of der der derivatives of that, but when we greet each other, when I see Frida, if I see Frida, I'd be saying Sabona, Sabona, 
which means I see you, except not really. It really means we see you. And, and, when, and then you're like, well, who's the we? All of my neighbors see Frida. My community sees Frida. We see Frida. We, my, my village, my ancestors see Frida with me. My deities see Frida with me. In this cosmology, all the things that, all of the, the, the whole panoply of the folks and things and, that make me me see Frida, we see her. And her response is, one, one response is Sincona with a click, which you can't do. Is anybody here from South Africa? South Africa, <laughs> test that. I can't click. But one response is Sincona, and 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 so Frida says, "I exist. You see me. I exist. The way you see me as an extension of you brings me to an existence." What's revolutionary about that is the way King translated it is, "We are inextricably connected, connected one to the other in a in a human garment of of love." When I see Frida as an extension of me, that's revolutionary love. I'm at the polls voting for her self-interest. I'm trying to think about economic policies that feed her kids. If, 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 I'm gonna, if, if, uh, Lisa is a black trans woman. And I'm loving her as myself. She's inextricably connected to me. I can't abide that she's unsafe in a police car. Her partner matters to me. Her kids that she had before she transitioned matter to me. And the me, I keep saying, starting with myself, if I don't matter to me, if I don't love me, if I don't get me, I have no, con I have no way to imagine how to really love her. Which is why the work all of you do is so super important to the love revolution. If I'm stuck at, I'm not, a, I'm not okay, I'm not good enough, I'm a wretch, I'm a worm, I'm horrible, I, I can't forgive myself for something I've done. I can't work it through. I can't find my voice. I can't take care of my little girl, Jackie. If I can't love me, the formula fails. When I'm thinking self-interest for Lisa, I don't have self-interest for me. I can't advocate for myself. I, how will I do that? I don't, I don't feel empowered. I don't feel equipped. I don't even have, I don't even have the experience of being well-held, well-loved enough to hold, hold somebody else and love them. That's mission critical for human thriving. And you all know with your therapeutic selves, how much disdain there can be for the practice of looking at our navels or gazing upon ourselves or turning a, a lens inward. The church doesn't affirm that, not nearly enough. Our culture says that that's narcissistic and it is in some ways, but not really, right? So how, Revolutionary love sets a table for an unconditional, an unconditional regard for the self. One of my favorite professors, uh, Jim Loader, was a, a therapist and a theologian, and he defined love as the non-possessive delight, the non-possessive delight in the unique particularity of the other. I love that. Mm. The non-possessive delight in the unique particularity of the other. So putting our, our psych with that, I'm, I'm, I, the self-love is an unconditional regard, right? An unconditional regard and delight for yourself, for your particularity. I'm weird. I'm, I'm slow in the morning. If I can't talk until I have coffee, that's not true for me, but that's John. And I love him, so my husband. But <clears throat> I'm hurt easily. I'm my 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 problem is my superpower. The place where Lynn helps me hover, you know, is the place where rivers of goodness will flow. 
recently, and Lynn, I've been quoting you again, recently when we were focusing and I was talking about a hurt feeling, stay right there. That's where the insight will come. That's where the wisdom will come. That's where the solution will come. And right then, a whole bunch of Black women were freaking out about the fact that Brianna Taylor wasn't going to have justice. Whether she was shot in her bed or shot in the hallway or it was nine shots or five shots, the kill shot that killed her just didn't matter because it was justified because she used to date a drug person. Stay right there, I wrote to a bunch of women. It's okay for that hurt to happen. The hurt is the strength. The hurt is where the insight comes. The hurt is where the re revolution will begin. It's where the empathy will come. So this idea of love neighbor as self, this idea of Ubuntu, I am a person through persons. We are inextricably connected. We see you has to have a, a me inside that is loved, that is well held, that is loved in a revolutionary way, which means I can look at myself, I can confront what's inside myself, I can forgive myself, I can know the parts that are not my fault. You know that amazing movie, Goodwill Hunting, that teenagers wrote, good God, <laughs> teenagers in college. <laughs> Excuse me. That scene where Sean, Robin Williams, and Matt Damon are talking, Will. Sean is looking through the folder. Will is guessing what's inside. Oh, so I have like a detachment disorder and you know, whatever, like, you know, like, you know, playing at therapy. And Will and uh, Sean just says to him over and over again, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Will, don't mess with him, not you. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Like. To be able to know what we need to own, what we can let go of, that's where the revolutionary starts. It starts with me. And you and I know that this is true, that there's a whole bunch, bunch of people walking around the world who don't love themselves. There's a hole in their souls where love could be. Those guys with the guns that were going to kidnap the governor of Michigan, they don't love themselves. Trump doesn't love himself. Sorry if you love him, but he doesn't love himself. Okay, so it starts with, revolutionary love starts with the self. And the next circle of that Ubuntu revolutionary love formula is really your posse. I see you, you exist. We see you, we exist. One of the responses is, Yabo Sabona, Yabo Sabona, which means I see you seeing me, or since we're a we, we see you seeing us. We recognize that. It's a mirror. My favorite one right? But we see you seeing us. And in this mirror where we see each other, seeing each other is empathy, but also accountability. I mash up all the things in my mind. So I'm going to mash up right now <laughs> a little bit, but like, this is about transitional space, the space between us. And not just about, you know, pacifiers and bears and kikis, but also about all the objects between us, all the things between us. In the, in the, in the, in the petri dish or this container or the space, the adaptive space in which we're becoming. How important it is to be seen and known and loved, seen and known and loved, not squinted at, not, there's no distinction, but like, 
The revolutionary love is like, I see the particularity of Melinda. She's not like Noor. Even if they're twins, but, you know, they, they, there is some uniqueness to be noticed, to be seen. As we, as we create this container in which we mirror back to each other, both the incredibleness of Ayana, but also holding with her what we see that she wants, that she wants to be different. So I think the unconditional love or the, or the positive regard or the unpossessive delight isn't, an, isn't like a pass <laughs> to be violent or harmful or keep coping in the ways you used to cope when you were six, you know? <laughs> like, there's something about the becomingness that we see, that we hold, that is revolutionary. And in my mind, what that, what that means is that I have hope <laughs> that this present time isn't the end. That the telos, the fulfillment of human existence is we're all well. So I'm going to mash up womanism in that. Alice Walker's beautiful definition of womanism is my thriving is your thriving. Like I hold hope that whatever it is that Dorothy wants, leans into, yearns for, goodness for her family, herself, her, her relationships, the environment, the earth, that among us, in between us, what we see in the space of, of our container is we, is we hope together that we can make a world together in which Kate's children thrive, Ayana becomes the human she's intended to become, the earth heals, the, 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 my religion isn't Jesus to say, my religion is love and that love will pull us all to love of planet, of each other, everyone will have enough, no more violence, and they were all on that trajectory. And hope is, hope comes from holding each other accountable to that vision, is what I'm trying to say. However you get the vision, wherever it comes, like if you get it from your favorite poetry, if you get it from your faith, life, what we're leaning into is a healed and whole world in which everybody has enough. And if I mash back to, to narrative for a second to say in which each of us is cast in the story as a healing agent with some power and to make a difference. I think that's revolutionary love in the next circle. And, and then just to say finally, because I'd love for you to talk to me about this, is that in that circle then just keeps widening. Like the, the, the you people tribe, Yabona, Yabo Sabona, we see you, we see you seeing us. Yabo, yes, Yabo Sabona, we see you seeing us. Ever increasing on these edges of our awareness and our accountability and our empathy are more and more people, more and more characters, more and more of us who belong to each other that the tribalism ceases to be my three people in my house or my five black aunties, but to a whole world of people who are not like us and like us. So what's revolutionary about love is it starts with you, it moves to your neighbor, 
It moves to your enemies and it moves to the whole world. To be Jewish for just a second and talk about what the rabbis say in the 63 times or so it says in the, in the scriptures, you're to love the stranger because you were once strangers. One time it says you're to love your neighbor in, in, the, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures. And the other times it says you're to love the stranger because you were once a stranger. And when the rabbis do the midrash on what it means to love a stranger, they say if, you're, if your enemy's cow wanders into your yard, you have to feed and water the cow of your enemy and then give it back. If the cow falls down under the burden of its full stomach, you have to pick it up and take care of it. I mean, this is the property of your enemy is, your, is yours to care for. So, the love revolutionary concept starts with me, my ability to love myself, to have help to get there so I can love my neighbor, so that I can live fully into the inextricable connection of us, so we can together as todo el mundo, the whole world, love our way to healing and wellness. And I shall stop there. <laughs> <coughs> Wow, thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Bob Dimio, is that your name or your part? Bob, I have your painting on my wall. Yeah, I have that. Mm -hmm. I'm mine. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Lynn? Let's, yes, let's just take a breath here. Wow, you've given us so much, Jackie so much to respond to so much to take in to drink in like you know <clears throat> like water and um we'll take a breath and then just see what anybody has to say is welcome and uh in just a few minutes we're going to go into breakout rooms where you'll have more space for everybody to um to be able to to sort of touch into what's there for them. But, but we'll share as a whole group now with, with Jackie, whatever is there, whatever you wanna say, whatever you wanna ask, it is open. Thank you for your vision, Jackie. I really um, uh, love what you said and um, can feel it and I wonder if you know about uh, this book that just came out that's called See No Strangers uh, Revolutionary Love by Valerie Kaur a woman from Sikh Face that's wonderful book and uh, that's echoing some of what you saying in a different way from a different angle but also yes. beautiful yeah. I know her. We're friends. Ah, uh, <laughs> of course, right? <laughs> we worked. We worked to share the revolutionary love concept together. Uh, oh. but, but Sophie, it it emerged in a couple of different places at the same time. Uh -huh. uh, Valerie was at a conference and was talking about it. I was working on a conference, and the young people who had been in Ferguson were talking about it. So we named our conference Revolutionary Love and invited Valerie to come speak. And she's <laughs> okay. like, oh, that's what we're doing. So, <laughs> so we're, we're friends together. It's a beautiful book. Let's yeah. make sure that we tell everybody about that. Yeah. And also Rabbi Michael Lerner has a book called Revolutionary Love. Uh, something like, um, I'm not doing the back end, but I have both of those books. Uh, so Michael Lerner's is Revolutionary Love, a, mem a political memoir, something like that. So I'm gonna put that in the thing. So she's that. What did you think, Sophie? Do you have a thing you'd want to say about how they're the same? Um, or different? Well, I love that you um, highlight the story and your story and how we, we are becoming from our stories. And she definitely also come very humbly and beautifully and authentically from her story mm -hmm. and um, 
for me, that's when I feel the love the most. Yes. You know, it's vibrating, it's alive, it's, it's, it feels so real. And um, it, yeah. yeah. And Sophie, do you want to tell Jackie and, uh, and others who don't know you where you're from? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm Sophie. I'm from France originally. Yeah. I hear that. But I've been here since I'm 24 in the 82 years. I'm in uh, Medford uh, near Boston. Okay, fantastic, Sally. Merci beaucoup. Merci. <laughs> We yeah. always ridiculous by right, people uh, who are here for the first time or the Shire people, but anybody is welcome to. Elizabeth had her hand up then? Yeah. Elizabeth had yes, her hand I did. Yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. Okay, wow, am I glad I came. All right, I'm only going to say one thing. You said this. My religion is not Jesus. My religion is love, and love will pull us all to love. Okay, right there. I mean, everything you said, I need a recording of this to take it in more and more and more. And as you spoke, and I read about you beforehand, that's why I woke up five minutes before this to come. Because <laughs> um, I really want to move back to Manhattan now that you're there. Oh. The back of my head, I had a felt sense or a body experience of, I, I didn't seek it, it happened. I realized the back of my head had grown into a shape of like an almond or something. It just expanded out that way. Huh. And it is because of that. My religion is love. Love. And love will pull us all to love. I mean, I started crying as soon as you oh. showed the film. I know, I didn't want to cry. Hey, I just woke up five minutes ago. I don't want to cry in front of 50 people. <laughs> and then you said later it was OK to be exactly as we are. And I believed you. And I'm, I'm a 10-year focuser, but I believed you. I said more than I intended, but I had to tell you that was so important. Thank you. I'm so embarrassed to be a pastor sometimes at all the ways that religion hurts, keep, and hurts people. I'm so embarrassed at it. So I'm, I'm just like, a, I'm, like a, I'm, being a, I'm being so subversive about undoing that as every way I can. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Jesus was love. He would he would he would be outraged if if at the things done in his name. Just a, yes. a, a rabbi trying to teach people how to love. So thank you for showing me your heart and the almond shape thing in your head. <laughs> you know, and you don't have to be in Manhattan to come to Middle Church. It's it's like we have people who belong to us in Ireland and in France. So. <laughs> So. Especially, especially during these virtual days. Yes, exactly. Especially, yes. And we're not going to let that go. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sheila. I just want to thank, thank you, you so much. I noticed we have the same last name, although mine is a diaspora name because the Jewish people in Poland who came over here, they didn't have that name. But I, I wanted to, I love, love everything you said. And particularly, I think you said in the beginning, um, about story. You knew your story really early on and that one of the things we can all do is shift or change that to include, I don't know, I don't remember your words, but uh, as someone who engages in story and story writing, I was very moved by that. And I feel like that's something collectively, all of us on this call and all the people you touch and all the people all of us meet um, in the collective way you describe those words, I can't remember anymore. Um, that's something we can all do. It seems deceptively easy, but I think it's something we can, we can really do to reshape all the chatter and narrative that's out there now. So I, I just wanted to thank you so much and uh, so glad I came on the call today. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you for saying that. I have to just say that um, I love the fact that you opened up with the, the, the song and the music. <laughs> um, actually, that song is very meaningful to me personally. At my son's bar mitzvah, we actually used that song with drummers. Oh, cool. But also, uh, Steve Moscovich, who's here, uh, did a wonderful program for our platform, coronaplaza.life, on music. Oh, and yeah. And it was such a heart opener. And people brought these songs that was from their childhood that they still carry with them. 
So oh, there was just something very significant about your opening up with that. Yeah, Melinda, that's a song from my childhood, right? I mean, I, Michael Jackson and I are exactly the same age. Bless his heart, he had a whole different life, but the same age is very moving to me. And I asked my team to put it together because, oh my God, we've been all dealing with so much. So they started working on this in July for October uh, so that we'd have this piece of music. And I'll put it in the chat. Please. Mm -hmm. I hope people are already asking for it. Okay, I'll do it. Let me do that. Let me do that while you're while you're right there, because you're going to go away into small groups and it doesn't work as well. <laughs> That's what I've learned. Lynn, do we have any more time for people to? Uh, well, let's have one more comment. I I just loved how you went back to your story of your childhood and your formation because I've spent the last thirty years working in the area of child protection in Ireland. Whoop. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> I'm not, I'm sorry. Hi, Terry, I'm sorry. Constantly step in and out of children's and families' lives and the story point of where the sickness is and the brokenness is and where love has become strained and damaged and torn apart. Yeah. Um, and it also brought to me too how you spoke as well of I suppose all the great leaders that you've had in your own country and, and, in, and in Ireland, we lost one of our greatest leaders here, John Hume, who passed away recently. And his words kind of really came back to me strongly today that difference is the essence of humanity. Mm. Difference mm. is the accident of birth and mm. it can therefore never be a source of hatred or conflict. The answer to difference is to respect it Therein lies a fundamental, therein lies a most fundamental principle of peace and respect for diversity. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that's it, was that, it was that love that he had for all communities in Ireland and all strands that began our peace process. Yeah. Alone, individual who agreed to place all at risk to listen to the side of those that were involved in war and armed fair when everyone else criticized him and yeah. he said he was doing it for the love of the nation for the love of our people yeah. and i think he then set us on a path to 25 years later having peace in our nation but it started from that principle in him and a principle of love and we can yeah. never estimate the power of what one individual can bring in their community their family, but also in their nation. I, it's so right, Derek. I, I think about your leader and I think about like Mandela in South Africa. Like how do you go to prison all those years and come out and, thinking and, that, and, it's crazy, wonderful. And this man ended up with Alzheimer's and he would get lost and people loved him in his city that when he got lost, they would take him in a taxi and bring him home and say to his wife, we found him, we brought him home to you, he's oh, safe. Nice. So his community came back to love him in the end till eventually he had to go into a nursing home. But he spent 10 or 12 years being able to, to be in his community and still go out and people know that John wasn't well, but people looked after John and brought him home if he got lost. That it came full circle for him. That's beautiful, Derek. And I think that that's, mm -hmm. that is in every single one of us. Yeah, absolutely, that's right. And, you know, Dr. King famously said, um, I'm paraphrasing him a little bit, but light, oh, the only thing that can drive out darkness is light. And the only thing that can drive out hatred is love. And this place where love has somehow been mischaracterized as some namby-pammy, wimpy, codependent love song thing. No, love is fierce and insists on justice and sees the goodness in everybody. And that's the only thing that is going to heal us. So I'm excited to keep love before us, to keep love in our consciousness and our conversations, to keep remembering, you know, yes, there's Eros and yes, there's uh, friend, you know, filial love, but that idea of agape, the idea of like this kind of strong, unconditional love, which, you know, I want to say, let's be honest, there are some conditions on that. The, the conditions on unconditional love <laughs> is that we keep expecting the best of the other. That's the condition, you know? So I, I am so grateful for this time with you. I, I wanna say, yeah, thank you, Derek, for putting that in the world. I'll get, I'll get this recording because I wanna share Derek's story of back in the world. 
Thank you so much, everybody, um, for just making some space for me to workshop some ideas with you. I'd love to stay uh, stay in conversation with you in all the ways that are, are appropriate. And thank you, Lynn, for inviting me to come. Oh, thank you so much, Jackie. And maybe, Derek, you could put some uh, something in the chat about uh, about it. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to go into our breakout rooms and say well, goodbye to Jackie for now. I also want to give a heartfelt uh, thank you, Jackie. And I just feel like this really opened up a lot. Like, I don't think we can just go away and just think we, you know, we had something on revolutionary love. This seems like a really a, a conversation that needs to continue. So, <coughs> I, I was thinking this morning that we talked about as, as the, this international helpers group, we've talked about so many different things, but we've never talked about love. And we never talked about it in this way. Um, and uh, it seems like so fundamental. So um, I'm looking forward to, to being with my people in the breakout room. <coughs> It's always a surprise who we're going to, to speak to. And we're only going to have um, maybe 12 minutes, uh, Melinda. That's so fine. And I just need to time. ask if anyone cannot stay for the breakout rooms, this is an opportunity to uh, say goodbye. <laughs> so I can do the breakout rooms and we'll have a num you know, fair number of people in there. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank bye. you, Jackie. Bye. Bye. Okay. You're welcome back anytime. I would love to come. Thank you all. Blessings. <laughs>